Hello. Good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum in Sanibel. And we're glad you're here for this program, Shell Dressed Seashells in Fashion and Jewelry with Gene Burks and Corey Rogers. Gene and Corey are uh, great friends of mine and former colleagues from Shelburne Museum in Vermont where both of them have long histories as curators of art, decorative arts, design, textiles, fashion, just about anything. And for this program, it's kind of a part two. Jean and Corey did a presentation for us in June on the subject of shells in 2000 years of art. And we're glad for this follow-up with the focus on fashion and jewelry. I had a chance to preview some of the images uh, last week and uh, there's some wonderfully inventive pieces in here. And I know you're gonna enjoy the program and thank you for joining us. Following tonight's program, the last in our series of online lectures, the Celebrating 25 Years Lecture Series is on October 20th. And it will be given by our own science director and curator, Jose Leal. And it's a Halloween special called Spooky Mollusks and Other Evils of the Deep. It'll be a fun program on October 20th. You can go to our website, shellmuseum.org and register for the program there. It is free of charge. And on, also on shellmuseum.org, we actually now have archived all the prior talks that have been part of this online lecture series. There are nine of them and they're all viewable uh, for free on our, on our lectures page. Of course, including Gene and Corey's previous talk, Jose with a, with a wonderful prior talk on the shells and photography exhibit that's up at the museum right now. James Evans gave a great talk this spring or last spring uh, he's from Santa Bel Captiva Conservation Foundation on water quality in the area. Kenneth Sassaman, University of Florida archaeologist, gave a talk a few weeks ago on shells in ancient indigenous cultures of the American Southeast. So there's a whole range, all accessible now at shellmuseum.org. So we hope you'll hope you'll check it out and you can watch them anytime. And this celebrating 25 years lecture series has been free. And we've been glad to uh, produce all these programs and, and make, them make them available for free, of course, during COVID. And then also with the, the seasonal shifts and ebbs and flows in the Sanibel area where people who might otherwise be attending programs in person here at the museum are, are elsewhere during this part of the year. So it's nice to be able to have these programs and be able to reach people where they are, and we, we hope to continue doing this uh, next off season. We, we hope to be start uh, to resume in-person lectures beginning in January here at the museum, but to continue doing Zoom programming as well into the future. And so we've been glad to offer it for free. And if, if you are so moved uh, to consider making a contribution to the museum uh, to help with the cost of, of producing these programs, other similar kinds of programs, or the museum's education mission in general. You can also do that at shellmuseum.org and click on the support us button that's at the top of the screen. So thank you for considering that. And that's that's all with the with the commerce portion here of the of the introduction. Uh, before I introduce Gene and Corey, just one housekeeping note. If you have questions, this is the Zoom webinar format. We welcome questions at, at any time. Uh, the way to do it is to uh, find <clears throat> the chat button uh, on the bottom of your, your Zoom screen, uh, click on that, and then type in your questions, and I will monitor those. And after, after the presentation, we'll do some questions and answers with Gene and Corey. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jean and Corey. Jean Burks is a specialist in 18th to 20th century decorative arts, who is curator emerita of Shelburne Museum, where she worked for 20 years. Jean's also held curatorial positions at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Winter Tour Museum, Canterbury Shaker Village, 
and other institutions. Now retired, Jean lives on Sanibel, where she shells frequently, and among other things, is a volunteer in the museum's collections department. Corey Rogers is the Francie and John Downing Senior Curator of American Art at Shelburne Museum, where he has worked in the curatorial department since 2005. Corey's expertise is very broad ranging from ceramics to contemporary design to the American circus uh, to fine art. And he is also passionate about and a big enthusiast of, uh, of seashells. So we're very glad to have Jean and Corey back. And Jean and Corey, welcome, welcome to the Zoom stage. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. Sam. <laughs> Before we get started on our presentation tonight, I just wanted to say how grateful I am, and I know Jean is grateful as well, to be back here tonight talking to you about a subject or two subjects that we both find interesting and have looked at both professionally and in our own uh, as part of our own interests. Um, before Jean um, left the museum, she worked on an exhibition on fashion called In Fashion, which was a really beautiful exhibition, and. I worked on a show with Jean, it was our last show that we actually co-curated together and it was called um, Natural Beauties and it was all about um, nature inspired jewelry design. And so this is sort of bringing us back together um, on two topics that we are both very passionate about. Uh, as we go through the slides here, what we're gonna see is not a comprehensive um, survey of shells in um, fashion and jewelry but a selection of uh, images of objects that we in clothing that we find particularly interesting and tell a certain story that we think is important for everyone to know about. Um, so it will be sort of a mix of historical artifacts as well as contemporary works of art. And so with that, I will say, Jean, it's over to you. Thanks so much, Corey. We thought it would be appropriate to start with carrier shells, which are the true originators of bling and date back to the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago. They're from the Latin family Xenophoridae, which translates to foreign carrying. Carrier shells will cement other snails, coral, and sea sponges to their exterior as wardrobe additions for several reasons. These added shell spines provide camouflage. They also serve as a defense and protection by forming a cage above and around the carrier mollusk below. To attach these foreign bodies to themselves, a xenophorid grabs an object with its muscular foot and holds it in place on its shell, while its mantle secretes a little mollusk glue made of calcium carbonate to fix it into position. Tyrian purple is a natural dye reserved exclusively for royalty, such as Emperor Justinian here depicted in flowing purple robes. It was at least 5,000 years ago on Crete when the first cultures discovered that these abundant Mediterranean sea snails could be crushed to yield striking colors. Popularized in ancient Tyre, which is now Lebanon and Phoenicia, the extremely expensive pigment became associated with elite status, power and wealth. Throughout history, it was used to color ceremonial robes worn by kings, queens like Cleopatra, and popes, and has become a tradition around the world. Made from the purple producing gland from an eviscerated hexaplex murex, shown here on the right, the pigment was greatly prized because the color did not fade in sunlight. The labor intensive process required at least a few hundred snails to produce just enough dye to trim a garment. We're jumping ahead a little bit in time here to 1949 with this beautiful example of a Christian Dior haute couture design. The French designer was known for using a specific 18th century gray and that um, forms the basis of the color for this dress. This dress is called the Junon dress, um, and it was designed to um, celebrate um, the Greek goddess uh, Venus or Juno or Hera, whichever um, version of um, the queen of the gods you um, are talking about. And it was a really beautiful example of how um, this is his signature style. He used these really beautiful iridescent beading and embroidery along the edges of these scalloped petals 
And it is um, a magnificent um, skirt that has those beautiful kind of ombre petals that um, also sort of look like a peacock's feather and or an eye of a peacock, but are actually designed to emulate the um, scalloped edges of a shell. The next is actually called a Venus, the Venus ball gown, and that was designed by Christian Dior in 1949 to 1950. And it was inspired by the Renaissance um, master um, Sandro Botticelli's Birth of Venus painting. Um, instead of Venus being carried on a beautiful shell, seashell here, um, the waves are emulated in the train of the dress, which is made up of glittering embroidery that is designed to replicate those foaming waves. Um, this has a, again, a foggy sort of gray silk tool and is arrayed in an overlay of scalloped shell petals. Um, it's called Venus, again, and the bodice and the shell form its skirt are embellished with a nacrist paillettes and sequins, iridescent seed beads, aurora borealis crystals, and pearls. Jumping ahead again in time, we're looking at the work of one of the greatest um, couturiers in the last a uh, couple of centuries, um, and that is the work of Alexander McQueen. Alexander McQueen was a British um, fashion designer who really took the fashion world by storm in the early 1990s. He was known for creating these really beautiful dresses that were very dramatic. They all could have sort of a, an edge to them, and um, they're often the sort of romanticized and macabre subject matter that, were, that was their source of inspiration. This is a dress from his Boss collection, which was the spring of 2001, spring, summer of 2001. And the Boss collection derives its name from a Norwegian town, which is known for wildlife, as a wildlife habitat. And thus the whole thesis behind the show was uh, to celebrate nature. This example here that you're looking at is made up of approximately 1200 razor clam shells that have been stripped, varnished, drilled, and sewn on a diagonal using monofilament, so sort of like fishing wire. And this has a tendency to fail because of the weight and the sharp edges of the, um, of the clams. And this was uh, taken advantage of during the performance on the runway. So McQueen's runways were very dramatic. They're almost like performance art. And in the case of Voss, um, the model who was wearing this particular dress, Erin Moore, um, stepped to the front and center of the stage and proceeded to tear off all of these shells as she was walking. Um, I wanted to read a little bit of a quote that Alexander McQueen said about this particular dress and sort of the source of its inspiration. He said, my friend George and I were walking on the beach in Norfolk and there were thousands of razor clam shells. They were so beautiful. I thought I had to do something with them. So we decided to make a dress out of them. The shells had outlived their usefulness on the beach, so he put them to another use on a dress. Then Aaron O'Connor, the model again, came out and trashed the dress, so their usefulness was over once again, kind of like fashion, really. The next example is another dress from the Boss Collection, and this is a really beautiful dress that's comprised of two-part construction. The outer layer is made up of a 19th century Japanese silk screen, and the underdress is made up of oyster shells. If you notice around the top of the dress, there is an interesting piece. It's a neck piece that was designed by Sean Lean for McQueen, specifically for the Voss show, and it's made up of silver and Tahitian pearls. The next example of Alexander McQueen using shells is this wonderful bodice using mussel shells. And in this example, um, you see that the, our, that the model who would be wearing this, the person who would own this bodice, would be encrusted with shell, these mussel shells like you might see up here in, in the ocean. Um, a really beautiful yet also sort of uh, macabre looking or um, edgy looking design that doesn't really give itself to movement. So with McQueen, it wasn't necessarily about function, it was more about the concept. The final example from McQueen that we'll look at tonight is this beautiful dress um, called the Oyster Dress. And it was part of the Erie um, Spring Summer Collection of 2003. The gown in this collection um, is described as a poetic rendering of a sea disaster. The Mets costume curator, Andrew Bolton, put it best when he said, this gown of sand colored organza recalls the millefeuille uh, ridging on the, shell, the surface of a shell the hem of the skirt, like the wavy lip of a giant mollusk, further emphasizes the shell-like quality of the gown. 
but unlike Aphrodite, who was born in the foam on the sea and born to the shore on a scallop, the queen's beauty is a bruised pearl encased in a deconstructing oyster that tumbled a tumbled survivor of the violent action of waves. Another rare and ancient product of mollusks is sea silk, the world's most exclusive textiles. Its threads were made by a Mediterranean mollusk, the now endangered noble pen shell or pinanobolus. Measuring up to a meter in height, these large bivalves root themselves to the seafloor by emitting hundreds of fibers known as byssus. Once extracted from the living shell, the filaments were soaked, spun into a fine thread and finally woven into small luxury items of clothing like gloves and stockings. Based on some ancient sources, in the Greek myth of Jason and the Argonauts, Jason's golden fleece may actually have been made of a mass of these byssus fibers. The British Admiral Horatio Nelson wrote of his intention to send his lover a pair of gloves made from byssus. And Jules Verne chose to dress his narrator in 20,000 leagues under the sea in a great coat of byssus lined with sealskin. To find out more about this ancient textile and the manufacturing plot process, tune into Joyce Matthews' upcoming Zoom program here at Bailey Matthews on October 7th. With its sheen and iridescence, mother of pearl is a material unique to shells. Made of calcium carbonate crystals, it's produced by mollusks as an inner shell later and when harvested is particularly suited for inlay on fashion accessories made throughout the world. This is a small 19th century lacquer box with compartments for medicines and cosmetics worn as an, an ornament on the waist sash of the traditional Japanese costume. Mother of Pearl is used here to form the squid, which I think is a particularly relevant motif given the giant Pacific octopus in the aquarium here at the museum. Although the purpose of this casket is unknown, it could have been used to store personal valuables, including jewelry. This casket belongs to a rare group of overlaid mother of pearl work produced in Northwest India in the 16th century. Most of the surviving examples are currently in museum collections like the Louvre. Furnishings of mother and pearl like this from India were listed in royal inventories and were imported to Europe since the early 16th century. Although initially commissioned by the Portuguese, these precious objects were traded throughout the European courts by merchants as high value gifts. Earlier this year, this casket was offered by Sotheby's and sold at auction for 499,000 great British pounds. The mother of pearl used on this casket to form those tall palm trees and flowering trees probably came from the shell of the Turbinella marmoratus, which was mainly found in the Indian Ocean and prized for its rare pinkish hue. We have seen how shells have been featured in fashion for the rich and famous, but they also make their appearance on clothing of everyday people. The practice of wearing garments decorated with mother of pearl buttons is first associated with Henry Croft, an English street sweeper who collected money for charity. In the late 1870s, Croft created a sequin suit to draw attention to himself and aid his fundraising activities. In 1911, the Pearly Kings and Queens was formed, an organized charitable society of working class culture in London. The Pearlies, as they are called, are still active today with many new groups, each associated with the church in central London, committed to raising money for London-based charities. At about the same time here in America, one business that was important to the state of Iowa was the fresh water pearl button industry. Muscatine opened the first factory in 1891 and soon became known as the Pearl City. So why did the button industry develop here? German born John Burpel was a master craftsman in Hamburg where he was skilled at making buttons from horn and seashells. He'd heard about the freshwater mussels in the Mississippi River, and he was convinced there was a fortune to be made 
in making buttons from these available and inexpensive raw materials with their pearl-like inside coating. In 1888, he arrived in the New World with his idea and built a foot-powered machine, gathered shells from the river, cut buttons, polished, and sold them. His idea caught on, and his method was mechanized by other local entrepreneurs. Rapid growth of the industry between 1890 and 1910 was due to the expansion of the market by commercially available clothing and the demand for a greater volume of buttons of a consistent quality that were cheaper. Also, the availability of industrial technology using steam and coal as power sources freed the worker from manually operating machines and thus increasing the speed of production. Within 10 years, Muscatine was the largest manufacturer of freshwater pearl buttons in the world. In 1898, the state turned out over 138 million buttons. The process required men, women, and children of various skill levels and involved a series of operations. Using a set of hooks dragged along the river bottom, workers collected boatloads of mussels, which is shown here in this historic picture. The shells were first boiled to remove the mollusk and then soaked in water to soften, shown on the left. Individual button blanks were created initially with a foot-powered lathe, shown on the right, and later with a machine-operated tubular saw. These blanks were then ground to an even thickness and taken to the finishing machine where one by one, the, first, the front surface of each blank was patterned and passed to the drilling machines to cut two or four thread holes. The complete buttons were polished and dried by friction in a series of tumblers containing acid, pumice, and finally sawdust. They were packed in boxes for shipping to clothing factories or sewn onto cards for the retail market. The button boom began a slow decline during the first half of the 20th century when plastics replaced pearl as a cheaper material. Cameos refer to the images of contrasting color that historically are carved from hard stone, glass, and seashell. Compared with hard stone and glass, shell cameos are relatively new, becoming fashionable during the Renaissance. However, the height of their popularity occurred during the Victorian era. For wealthy English Victorians in particular, the grand tour of Italy was mandatory, and Italian cameos were the one must-have item brought home as a status symbol. Even Queen Victoria routinely wore them, and of course what she wore became a trend on both sides of the Atlantic. During this period, cameos displayed mythological, historical, or religious images, although the vast majority depict the profile of an unidentified woman with intricately arranged hair, like the classical lady on the left, or identifiable portraits of rulers or important, digni or important dignitaries like Andrew Jackson on the right. This carved helmet conch shell is a tribute to the seventh United States president cut in about 1835. It is inscribed with Jackson's slogan, the union it must and shall be preserved. Cameos were worn by men as stick pins, rings, and cufflinks while women wore cameos as brooches, earrings, pendants, and bracelets. From historical um, cameos, we're gonna be looking, at, we're gonna be moving on to um, a contemporary artist um, who makes contemporary cameos. Um, this slide and the next show the cameo making process of contemporary Japanese jeweler and artist, uh, Shinji Nakaba who is best known for his jewelry made out of natural pearls carved to look like tiny skulls. As an aside, he prefers natural pearls because carving cultured pearls reveals the inner core. Here we see what appeared to be a horned helmet shell or a cassis cornuta, commonly found in the coral reefs throughout in the Indo-Pacific where they prey on sea urchins and coral. Despite its large size and thick shell, horned helmets are actually less commonly used to be create um, cameos and perhaps because of the large horns. Unlike the traditional cameo carving in which you saw in the previous slide where they were using the body of the shell, the flatter portion of the shell to create um, their cameos, Nakaba is actually using the horns to create three-dimensional cameos. 
Here, you can see the process where he's cut off one of the horns, he shaped the perimeter, and he's drawn on a sketch of a horse's head. On the other side you see of the screen, you see the finished product. He has used this sort of protruding shape to create a variety of different types of cameos. They run the gamut from animals such as horses and pigs, all the way to human anatomy, such as arms and legs. The next piece we're gonna be looking at is this rather unusual bracelet. The unusual looking cabochon stones set into this Victorian bracelet, which is made of gold, are often referred to as cat's eyes, evil eyes, and the eyes of Shiva. They are neither eyes nor stones, but in fact, the operculum of freshwater and marine snails. Latin for lid or cover, the operculum acts as a trap door for the snail, um, forming a watertight seal that protects the body when it's retracted into the shell and uh, serving as an effective form of protection from predators and are drying out in the sun. While when the, when the animals are alive, operculums are flexible membranes they harden into a, a solid shell-like material after the snail's death. The next piece we're gonna be looking at is um, a, a royal piece of jewelry. And we saw how Justinian in the very second, the second slide was wearing his um, purple cape. So shells have also been used um, as jewelry to adorn um, royalty. This is a scallop shell and it's entirely pave set with, which is an invisible setting with hundreds of brilliant cut diamonds. Brilliant cut means that they're a fat, it's a cone shaped stone that has multiple fastening across the top and, the, and has a flat table. And that was designed to create more surface for which the light to bounce around in and thus giving the stone its um, lustrous sheen. Uh, this, the middle of the uh, brooch contains a single pearl, and then below are five unequal pamphiles or articulated drops that are set with square cut stones with a single pearl shaped stone at their ends. The setting is made entirely of white gold. The story behind this particular brooch was that it was bequeathed to the queen mother when she was actually the queen in 1944, who um, you can see here in this photograph. It was given by Mrs. Winifred Hope Thomas, Thompson, excuse me, a former, uh, a popular British artist, illustrator, and author of several cookbooks. It was designed by her bachelor brother, the Count, or excuse me, Lord Courtauld Thomas Thompson, and made by the Goldsmith and Silversmiths Company um, of London. According to Mrs. Um, Thomas Thompson's um, wishes, the brooch was given as a quote mark of respect and profound admiration. She also stipulated in her will that the jewel be passed down as a personal possession from queen to queen of England. And that means that it's, this particular piece does not belong to the royal jewels. Um, here you can see um, the queen mother, um, Elizabeth Bow Bowes Lyon Windsor, wearing the brooch on the occasion of her 100th birthday. The reigning Queen Elizabeth inherited the brooch in 2002 and has been photographed wearing it as part of her everyday day attire. Duke Foucault de Verdura began his career in the 1920s in Paris, creating iconic pieces for his good friend Coco Chanel. In 1934, he ventured to America and designed jewels for movie stars of the era, including Greta Garbo and Marlene Dietrich. On September 1st, 1939, when war broke out in Europe, his friends Cole Porter and Vincent Astor financed his debut on Fifth Avenue. So with Europe off limits during the war, Verdura gained a following of high profile clients among society and fashion's best dressed list in New York and California. Tula Bankhead had one of Hollywood's great jewelry collections. She was a good friend of Verdura and was often spotted wearing his iconic lion's paw shell brooch here about 1945. Verdura purchased a collection of seashells from, of all places, the gift shop at the American Museum of Natural History in New York and set them in gold with precious stones. This version is encrusted with sapphires and diamonds. Throughout history, imitation has always been the highest form of flattery. 20th century American designer Kenneth J. Lane proudly produced what he himself called, quote, fake and junk jewelry, end quote. 
He was the first American jewelry designer to make it not only acceptable, but also chic to wear faux, faux jewelry while he himself was transformed into a high society persona whose lifestyle was anything but cheap. His customers and friends included some of the world's richest and most influential women, including Jack and Kennedy, Audrey Hepburn, Elizabeth Taylor, Nancy Reagan, and Princess Diana, quite a diverse clientele. Throughout his career, he was particularly fond of seashells, which found their way into many of his earrings, brooches, and pendants. He was totally candid about his creativity when he proudly admitted, quote, my designs are all original, original from someone, end quote. He drew inspiration from all over, the museums of the world, British royalty, and the work of other celebrated designers like Verdura. Here is his version of Verdura's recognizable lion's paw brooch, which he mass marketed on QVC on television. Renowned 20th century jewelry designer, Jean Slumberger, was one of only four artists allowed to sign his work at Tiffany and Company, along with Paloma Picasso, Elsa Peretti, and Frank Gehry. His designs pull elements from the natural world with a variety of aquatic motifs featuring brightly colored gemstones. Quote, I try to make everything look as if it were growing, uneven, at random, organic, and in motion, end quote. This sapphire, diamond, and emerald seashell brooch and bracelet feature gold sculpted gastropods and bivalves, and it was designed for Mrs. Peggy Rockefeller. From high-end jewelry to jewelry that you could make at home, this wonderful example of a um, seashell jewelry kit was produced by the Walco Company. And it was not only um, was it designed for a children's activity, but it was designed to teach children dexterity. Um, in this particular case, the kit provided the uh, mid-century American families with the materials and tools to make these shell jewelry. If you notice in the image here, in the little sort of orange square at the top of the open box, you'll see that there's an awl for creating the hole in the um, shells and beads so that you could string through. As, and then also that little piece of wood in the middle that has a little indentation in the center was the base so that you would put your shell on and then drive your awl through it. This um, for centuries, for millennia, from time immemorial, Cult, different cultures around the world made their own jewelry and they, uh, shell jewelry using shells that they found on seashores. And in this case, you could buy it in the, in the local um, heart, uh, department store or toy store, and it gave people the license to create something that was unique to them. The next piece is um, a piece of jewelry designed by um, American jeweler Ted Newling. And he's a master of paring down natural forms to their simplest and most essential elements. Uh, in this pair of gold spiral shell earrings, both um, are works of, that are both works of art and also thoughtful engineering. Muling has taken the natural shape of the shell's whorls and uses them to create a spiral clasp for the back wire, thus securing the earrings so that, and preventing them from falling off um, in everyday use. Muling also created this really beautiful example of a brooch. And this brooch is uh, based on a, a clamshell. And again, what you see is you see the top view of the brooch, but you also see the side view. And again, he's using the curl of the, of the shell to use as the class for the pin. Um, this shell is made of oxidized bronze. So not a, typically a um, material that we think a, a precious metal or metal like gold or silver, but um, in this case, what he's done is he's disguised the bronze by oxidizing the surface, which is a patina to make it look tarnished. And in this case, it was produced using a little bit of vinegar and some salt and a paintbrush. And the vinegar solution and salt solution, when you put it all over the bronze, um, takes its time and starts to um, change the look of the surface of the piece of jewelry. Now I want to talk to you about you know, high-end jewelry, and now we're looking at an example of humorous jewelry. This is the snail shell, um, fingers of a, uh, it's made out of uh, a snail shell and fingers of a rubber glove and a gold pin. Uh, if you look at the glove, you'll see that the textured pattern that was designed to help grip 
um, has actually become the pattern of a snail. I apologize for all the noise. My little um, Floridian greyhound has decided to join the, uh, the program tonight. Um, like the snails that die when their skin dries up, the rubber glove becomes brittle and over time and eventually breaks down, leaving the shell behind, mimicking the real snail's life cycle. Finally, I wanted to end the presentation on a sort of a higher note um, than a dying snail. And that's with this wonderful smiling seashell brooch that um, I need to make a, a confession. I misattributed this in the last um, presentation that we had. I said that it was by David Belander, the Dutch designer that we saw in the previous slide. And this example is actually created by Benedict Fischer, who's a German jewelry designer. Um, but, uh, so the German jewelry designer Fischer believes that animals, an animal is always present in jewelry making, um, in his jewelry making, and it becomes a symbol or of instinctive nature as well as artistic materials. In this case, it's the latter. Here he has taken the spiny clamshell and excavated through the outer layer of the shell to expose the nacre or mother of pearl, hence the play on world, words pearly whites. He's created a variety of these pins using various different um, species of uh, pearl uh, shells, excuse me, and he's cut their teeth in a variety of different patterns. And some of them he's named after specific uh, dental uh, maladies. Jean, is there anything else that you want to say to close this out? And I again apologize for my grand. I don't think that I can add anything to that. It was terrific. <laughs> Corey, bravo, maintaining your discipline there, you know, because you know, it wasn't the easy. dog, the dog <laughs> encroaching. He's hungry. <laughs> this wonderful greyhound, whose name, by the way, is in, in, in honor of one of one of Corey's uh, professional areas of uh, areas of professional specialization is decoys, right? Decoys, the name of the dog? No, the dog's name is actually Lowy. He's based oh. after uh, the designer of the greyhound bus, Raymond Lowy. Oh, okay. So again, it is one of mine. My... Also pretty cool. Also yeah. pretty cool. So uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in on the uh, using the chat function. Uh, I, I have one or two, which which if you don't mind, I might might start with the the uh, to me that you know we talked about sort of the, the real high end pieces, some of the the mid century uh, pieces that Tiffany really really jumped out. Is there a shell that is um, kind of reliably very valuable uh, within the context of high end jewelry. Um, you know the way the way a diamond is. You know, with the uh, um, in in another form, is there is there a shelf that is kind of associated with high value in jewelry? Don't know. Speak at once here. Um, from my from my perspective, what I find interesting is that jewelry seems to be able to make great use of shells of all types, whether they're bivalves or gastropods, and that I don't seem seem to feel that there's anything that's particularly higher end. The, the, the thing that we saw with the decorative arts objects, I think, was the Nautilus shell was particularly valued. But as far as jewelry goes, what do you think, Corey? I think that if if you're sourcing materials, it would probably stand to reason that the more exotic shells that are coming from, you know, the South Pacific or some area like that, those would be more expensive because they are rarer um, in the Western world and jewelry making uh, areas. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Angela. When did the use of purple dye murexes for dyeing garments cease? Excellent question. I think as everything, uh, when a more available, cheaper substitute is invented or comes on the market, then the labor intensive uh, product is no longer used. So when you think of vegetable dyes coming into being and particularly aniline dyes in much later in the what 19th century, um, commercial dyes that are produced, you, you didn't obviously need to have this royal purple and it became, the color became much more available. Thank you. Question from Hannah, is this recording available to watch later? Uh, yes, uh, well, it probably takes us a couple days usually to, to edit these and post them to our website. 
but it'll be, it'll be up at uh, shellmuseum.org along with all the uh, previous lectures from this series. Thank you for asking. Peter has a question. What is the size of the Andrew Jackson cameo and what tool is used to carve shells? That's a great question. Um, that piece is at the Met, at the Metropolitan Museum. It is, um, I have not seen it in person, um, but I would, I'm suspecting it's probably smaller than two inches. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, that's probably it, about the standard size. I like think it's a, it would be a, that standard size. And I'm not sure what this, uh, the, the fellow who made it in the 19th century would have used to carve it. I suspect that different tools would have been used in different periods, uh, depending on the availability of the tools and the shell that they were actually using. So I'm not sure what tool was used in that. And I'm, I don't know if the Met knows, but it might, they might have it on their, in their cataloging information. I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Okay. <clears throat> Question from Lisa. I have some very old shell necklace lays from the South Pacific. How can I find out if they have any value? Well, you would have to find a um, appraiser, someone who is knowledgeable in jewelry and um, someone who knows something about shells. Um, as curators, we're not allowed to assign value to objects, so I'm afraid we, we can't help you. Um, but yeah, I think you could probably find an appraiser in, locally. Appra yeah, appraiser, auction house, something like that. Helen has a question. Do any museums feature this uh, jewelry and fashion? I guess museums featuring shells in jewelry and fashion. We do a little bit yeah. here at the Shell Museum uh, within the Great Hall of Shells, but do you guys know of any others? I think, you know, most museums have their collection on rotation, especially for fashion because it's such a um, delicate and um, ephemeral uh, material. You know, it's susceptible to light and fading. It's susceptible to uh, uh, insect infestations. Um, so those objects are usually um, rotating in and out, um, typically with themed exhibitions. I can't think of any museum off the top of my head that would have um, specifically um, shell jewelry other than this wonderful institution um, out on a permanent basis. When Corey and I did uh, the In Fashion show, it was quite a feat to extract these, uh, these pieces from other institutions because they were all in storage. They all had to be taken out. They had to be fitted to mannequins. They had to be shipped to us. So if you see an exhibit on fashion and jewelry, I would go to it because you're likely not to see those garments for a very long time. If you're looking for some fashion museums that you should check out, the Met has obviously the Costume Institute, which is really extraordinary in every May or not May this year. It was a little bit later because of COVID. But every May they have the big um, gala event um, and they always have these themed exhibitions. Also, if you're in New York, the uh, FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology has an amazing museum where they have rotating exhibitions of their collections. So I highly recommend those. And actually the Cleveland um, Museum of Art is also really amazing in Cincinnati. Yeah. Thank you. And one last question here from Richard. Oh, another one's coming too. Um, question from Richard. I've seen a lot of different colored lion's paw, but I'm most interested in the pure white kind. Do you know if this is dyed or bleached or might this be a particular kind of shell? I don't know. I'm wondering, um, there's two possibilities. I'm wondering if it's a really, really rare albino. There are albino shells. Um, I know I try to collect them on the beach here when I see them, but they're very rare. So I don't know if a white one is an albino. I doubt it would be dyed. It could be, I guess. Um, what do you think, Corey? Uh, was he asking about the lion's paw in the Vidura lion's paw? Was he asking about the color of that particular shell? I'm most interested in the pure white kind. Do you know if this is dyed? Yeah, I would dyed or bleached or might this be a particular kind of shell? No, I think he was asking okay. about what's the, what's the source of white. white. Yeah, I, I would defer to Gene on this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, question from Leslie. 
Okay. Is there somewhere where I can take a very old, large cameo that belonged to my mom for more info about it? Age, material, value. Once again, a, an appraiser. Uh, a, uh, yeah. Yeah, that would be your best bet. Yeah, an appraiser. Or, you know, for any scientific information about the actual shell, Dr. Leal is really at the museum is your source for that. But when it comes to, you know, value, um, that's when you would need the appraiser. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Oh, okay. There might be one more here. No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much, audience, for the terrific questions and for, for joining the program. And look ahead to, to uh, Jose Leal's program on October 20th, Spooky Mollusks and Other Evils of the Deep. Big, big, big thanks to Corey, who's in Vermont, and Jean, who's here in Sanibel, just a couple doors down from where I am here in the office, um, for, for doing this program. And it's, uh, it's great, to, great to see you on screen. And uh, thank you for bringing this really fascinating subject to all of us. So. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you, and have a, have a great evening or rest of the day. Thanks, you too. All right.